Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. Um, so I'm going to turn the program on over to our uh, wonderful friends in Applied Math and Statistics and Professor Alan Tucker. So thank you all for being here today. Let's see, Marissa, did you want to give the welcome? Sure, I just thank you all for being here. Um, this is our, I believe, our fourth installation of the Applied Math and Statistics Alumni Spotlight Series. So we're very lucky to have Dr. Howard Singer with us. But before we get to Dr. Singer, I should introduce Dr. Tucker, who I'm sure most of you know. He's been with Stony Brook University since 1970, has a steel trap memory, and can probably tell you countless conversations he had with you if he ever had any with you. Uh, he is a fellow of the American Mathematical Society and of the American Association for Advancement of Science. He has added a multitude of class and expertise to Stony Brook University, and I will hand it over to him now. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tucker, for being here. Uh, my pleasure. And it's really nice to see uh, former students, more than one, as well as current students here. Um, I want to thank the Stony Brook AMS Student Committee and the Career Center for co-sponsoring this event. And I want to invite Olita Nazarov, uh, the Vice President of the AMS Student Committee to say a few words. Olita? Sure thing. Uh, thank you, Professor Tucker. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lolita, and I'm the Vice President of AMS Committee, which is a subsidiary of Math Club, whose mission is to inform students about the wide range of possibilities with a degree in applied math and statistics and serve as a networking and learning platform. Um, we've held speaker events where we invited people from companies such as Morgan Stanley and Quizlet, and we've held joint speaker events with Math Club where we invited representatives from uh, Google, Goldman Sachs, City. Um, we've helped people land interviews and get connected with companies, and we've also held uh, workshops to introduce our members to various tools and technologies that may be used on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're excited to be co-hosting this event. I'm a major music lover myself, and I'm a comp sci major, so I'm personally interested in Dr. Singer's line of work in uh, Warner Music Group. Um, and lastly, thank you, Marissa and the Career Center for coordinating this event and Professor Tucker for moderating it. And um, thank you for offering your time this afternoon, Dr. Singer, and we're super excited to have you here. Thanks. Okay, well, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Howie Singer, who was an AMS major, along with a computer science major, along with the math major graduating in 1974. Uh, the first time he came back to Stony Brook was to be a potential candidate for a job opening in operations research. He came, I think that was in 1978, but he didn't stick around very long because he wanted to rush back for the, the weekly volleyball game that the operations research department had at uh, Cornell that was a ritual that could not be missed. He's uh, had these diverse interests all his life and in fact, I have a bio sketch and I'm going to do what I do with my classes now. And I'm just going to share that with people so I can read it, but people can have it to uh, return, refer to for the future reference. So he spent 15 years at Warner Music. This was after his original career as a traditional operations research person at Bell Labs at, uh, after being at Warner, well, at Warner, he rose to become um, a senior vice president and chief strategic technologist. And then he became a consultant to Universal Music Group, uh, MTA Limited and others advising on product services technology related to high resolution music, artificial intelligence podcasts and streaming data analysts. Um, he co-founded uh, the company A to B Music. And um, before that, he had a 20 year career at Bell Labs where he was involved in a wide variety of service analysis problems for 
Bell Labs uh, back in the days when there was one telephone company for all of America. And their research center was uh, the match of Harvard or Stanford in terms of their accomplishments. Things like the transistor that runs all computers was discovered at Bell Labs. He and before this, he received a PhD and MS at Cornell, and before that, a triple degree at Stony Brook. And he's recently also been an adjunct faculty member in the music program at NYU teaching data analysis for business. Um, I think I've said enough. I hope Howie is humbled, but he has had a wonderful career, and I think people will want to hear about it. Howie. Thanks so much uh, for inviting me and welcome everybody. Um, you know, as I sort of says, it's not traditional to start with a, you know, degrees in math and um, operations research and end up in the music business. Um, and I'll spend, you know, the first part of the talk sort of doing that career path sort of talk. Um, and then the latter part talking about how the music industry has changed and how data, which was never really part of the business, the music industry was an industry that worked on its gut and the people that got the best positions in the music industry were the ones who um, had that gut and ears to pick out who the best artists were likely to be in the future. Um, and it's become an industry that's driven uh, by um, data analytics and uh, data in part because of the shift in, in formats to, to streaming music. I'm happy to take questions and interruptions. I've been now teaching on Zoom for almost a year. So I'm kind of used to seeing all these faces that looks like the Brady Bunch show for those of you who can remember that. And I'm gonna start sharing my screen and my slides. But um, so I can't see everybody now on my screen as I look at those slides, but if anybody has questions turn on your mic or raise your hand or we'll save questions for the end. So you all know why you're here. I don't have to go over this slide again. Um, and you know, getting from Stony Brook to the Warner Music Group is definitely a long and winding road. And the music industry is known for being a, a difficult business. Um, There's a famous quote from Hunter Thompson that the music business is a cruel and shallow money trench, a long plastic hallway where thieves and pimps run free and good men die like dogs. <laughs> There's also a negative side. Um, it, it's actually not, it's a great quote and it's he actually, the longer quote was not about the music business, but it, it, it sort of has become one that people use to describe it. And it's sort of ironic that it really wasn't about, the actual quote wasn't about the music industry, but that's what it's become known for. Um, so as uh, Professor Tucker said, I was a math and computer science major at Stony Brook until it was actually my father-in-law who was a civil engineer said, you might be interested in this operations research thing. And I took introduction to operations research and in the first class, and I have a couple of illustrations the professors, one being Professor Beltrami uh, at the time, uh, presented the analysis he had done on routing garbage trucks in New York. So the street graph is meant to show the Manhattan metric because you measure distance in Manhattan and driving times differently than just a straight line. The, the, the picture below is obviously the, the garbage truck in New York City and that's the old logo for Stony Brook when it was referred to as SUNY Stony Brook when I was there. And that was when I decided um, to add to my two majors and become an applied math major as well, because I finally took something where I got to use the skills I had built in my other math and computer science programs to solve problems that seemed much more interesting to me. And um, one of the people that helped guide me towards graduate school, and I, uh, uh, oh, I, I, I added this as a, this is just to remember the era I was in was we went to the computer center and submitted punch cards for our program and waited to get printouts from how that ran and, and then, you know, had to fix the errors and, and do it again, which when you were writing a program to, you know, simulate truck routes and had a thousand punch cards, um, that was no easy task to, to even find the right card to change when you, you know, found the bug in your program. But that's the state of the technology that we were in at the time. Um, 
uh, I was uh, pleased. This is this is from the plaque that still hangs in the in the building there at Stony Brook. That my name is there for 1974 for the senior award. And the person who helped me, I thought he'd like this picture, was <laughs> Professor Tucker, heavy <laughs> on the sideburns back in 1974. Um, and he advised me on what graduate schools would be best. And uh, um, I thought I was going to go to either Stanford or Cornell and ended up in part because of my uh, wife's graduate school acceptance at Cornell and started in what was a fairly theoretical program. The picture on the left is from a paper about matroids. And if you ask me to explain now what a matroid was, I couldn't do it. Um, but the reason I got into operations research, as I just told you when I was at Stony Brook, was I was fascinated with the applications of things and not with the theory of things. And I shifted from being working with uh, Ray Fulkerson, who actually was Professor Tucker's advisor way back when, and was quite theoretical, to working with a professor who specialized in inventory control and uh, repair models and much more practical applications as opposed to sort of pure mathematical applications. And that was what I did my thesis at Cornell in was in inventory management. Um, my first job was at Bell Labs um, after getting out of graduate school where I worked on sort of a bunch of sort of traditional OR problems. At that time, phones were not sold, phones were leased. The Bell system, which when I started with it had a million employees, um, never sold anything. And in the time that I, when I was arriving is when they first opened phone center stores. Unlike now, if any of us could go to a mall where there'd be eight different phone stores from, you know, uh, uh, T-Mobile to Verizon to AT&T, there were no stores, but AT&T started them and they didn't have, even have an electronic cash register system to keep track of the money. And they didn't have an inventory control system to figure out how many pink trim line phones they should stock versus, you know, black rotary sets. I built that system. That was my first project at Bell Labs was design uh, the electronic systems for these phone center stores, which were brand new um, and worked on a bunch of other things where, you know, I eventually shifted to management, but we did employee scheduling for call centers. We did simulations for factories that manufactured telephones, a lot of classical operations research problems. Um, and over time, I shifted to sort of managing R&D project, first managing operations research projects, but eventually managing teams of electrical engineers who designed hardware as well. And so, you know, I became conversant in project management skills and market research and doing business cases and actually ran teams that developed things like early cell phones. The picture in the lower right is what is known as a bag phone. You didn't even get the phone in your car. You had to plug it in to have run it off the power and you would carry it from car to car. The picture on the left is a video phone. I know we all use FaceTime now and we're using Zoom, but in the early 90s, AT&T introduced a consumer video phone that plugged into normal phone lines that could send a few images per second on um, uh, a standard telephone line. So there was no broadband yet, but we built a product that was expensive um, and it didn't uh, sell a lot of units, but um, you know, it was sort of the hit of the show at the Consumer Electronics Show and the team that I managed uh, designed that product. And the last thing I did at at and was I gradually became a person that was trying to figure out how to take these new technologies and turn them into products. So now we're talking mid nineties. We still did not have broadband. We still had phone connections and modems that squeaked and squawked. But one of the things that was clear is that it was gonna be possible to ship music over the internet. Um, and uh, at the at the time we started a company, it was an internal startup called A to B Music that was meant to be atoms to bits, meaning moving from shipping at, uh, music as atoms, physical CDs to bits over networks. And AT&T had assets in audio compression and in software security, and we built a software player. So the, the picture on the right with Belinda Carlisle, the artist, this was a software player that lived on your computer at first only um, that secured the music and we could sell it over the internet 
and download it so fast that it was quicker than going to your record store. And by the way, that meant that the download took 10 to 15 minutes for a single song. If any of you started to, you know, decided you wanted to download a playlist from Spotify today and it took 15 minutes, you would become really frustrated. We were marketing 15 minutes as an improvement over drawing to the record store. Um, one of the things that was built into that player was pro public private key cryptography because the music companies were very nervous about sending their music unsecured. All the music on the CD was in the clear. Um, they were very nervous about sending it in an insecure fashion. So they insisted on protection mechanisms for the music that became a, a less than viable plan when Napster happened, which we'll come back to in a little bit. The picture on the lower left, not only were we selling music over the internet, but we were going to the music companies with this little portable player on hand, the um, white thing sticking out of the, you know, uh, uh, playing card size box on the right is a memory card. So this was a flash music player. And unlike all the CD players people were carrying around, there were no moving parts. And on that flash card, we put an album. And so we were walking around with, you know, some could say, a, you know, a precursor to the iPod and everything else that came around that said, not only will you put the music on your computer, you'll put it on a flash card and you'll take it with you. And that's the way you'll be able to listen to your music on the go. So we had all the piece parts that were necessary, but we were making this pitch to the music companies at the time that the CD was dominating the industry. And I'll show you a graph later. It was incredibly, incredibly profitable. And so although the music industry at one level understood what was coming, um, they couldn't, in the classic sense of the innovator's dilemma that's been written about, move from what was so profitable for them to this nascent uh, uh, speculative venture of selling music over the internet until they were forced to do so. Um, and just to give an example, when we went into one of the major music companies and showed them all these toys that we had and explained what the business could be and played mp3 files through the sound system in the chairman's conference room you'll forgive me for my language in a moment but this is an exact quote no one is going to listen to that shit that's what the music companies heard and of course they were wrong about that because today we all listen to that the quality has improved somewhat from those early much more compressed versions in part because we were dealing with narrow band connections and not broadband um, so this is a quote from 1999 in the New York Times uh, that was about the music industry trying to get its act together. Um, and what I was quoted as saying then was that um, the pressure was mounting for the industry to do something and that people were getting used to not paying. And this, you know, part of the goal of doing these kinds of interviews in the paper was to convince the industry they should take this more seriously and, and work with us, right? They were working with our company, A to B Music. They were working with a company called Liquid Audio, but they were all sticking a toe in the water. They were small experiments. They didn't, you know, in the sense we would say today, you go all in, they were not going all in. They were barely, you know, waiting in the pool, right? And the reason was that that CD was just so profitable. Um, of course, we were talking about downloading music, but that wasn't the only thing that we were talking about. Um, and then in June 99, this article was from February, Napster was launched at Northeastern University by Sean Fanning. And within four years, 25% of the revenues of the music industry had disappeared. Right. So my prediction was right. They should do something quickly. They didn't do something quickly. And instead the industry got uh, so damaged that it's only in the past five or six years that it started to come back as the streaming business has generated significant revenues. Um, as I said, we, were only, we weren't only doing downloads. We actually built a prototype streaming service as well. So this is a picture of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, AT&T was a sponsor of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And so our team built a jukebox. 
that was a streaming service. It had a computer server in the basement. It had a fast network connection because there was a local area network in the museum. Um, and we put multimedia kiosks in the museum and every song from every inductee in the Hall of Fame was stored on the server in the basement. And you could go up to one of these kiosks. By the way, they've been updated with newer technologies. That picture is of me just a few years ago. It still exists at the Rock Hall. Um, you go up and you can, I think it's the Eagles on the screen. It has, now this is 1997, which I have to think about. Um, you know, you went up to the screen, you touched the name of the artist, all the album covers came up, you touched the album cover, all the songs on the album came up, you touched the song, it immediately streamed from the server in the basement. So again, this is not all that dissimilar, a much, much smaller catalog than any of us can access today on Spotify or Amazon or Apple Music. But at the time, it was the biggest jukebox in the world. It had 30,000 songs every song from every inductee that had been entered into the Hall of Fame. And in the interviews then, uh, at that time, and this was an article a little after we built the jukebox, um, would consumers pay for this kind of access? I said, yes, again, but of course we were way too early, right? So this was after Napster had hit. Um, and uh, you know, I, I left uh, A to B Music because AT and T. The plan was to spin it out from A to B Music, and then they canceled the spin out. And instead, the people uh, that had formed this little entrepreneurial venture all left and went to work for another startup company that was funded by um, Microsoft and SoftBank to do some of the same sorts of things. And that experience is what got me to uh, Warner Music because by the year two thousand two. As I said, the industry had been decimated with 25% um, uh, of the revenues being lost. And um, uh, they were much more anxious to figure out now, well, now what do we do? And so they were looking for people with a background in e-commerce and security and rights management. And that was how I got the job at uh, Warner Music. Um, this is a graph that shows you what happened to the industry then. If any of you look up uh, RIAA revenue sources, this is actually a, a live chart in the sense that if you scroll over it, it will give you the individual numbers by year, by format. Um, there's also a unit chart that's available. So this is a great source of revenue if anybody wants to, of numbers, if anybody wants to look at the history of the music industry. But if we go back to when I was at Stony Brook in 1973, the business was dominated by these blue colors. The blue colors are solid blue is vinyl. And then the other shades of blue are um, cassette and eight track. I'm sure none of the students remember eight track tapes, but they were popular for a minute. And you know uh, the cassette gradually grew to be a big part of the business, but the business was sort of flat and the CD was introduced in the early eighties and got to the point where in 1999, it was 95% of the business, basically, and incredibly profitable. The industry even stopped issuing as many singles in part to get you to purchase the album, whether that was for $13 or $17. There were times, you know, there were artists that were one hit wonders that had only one great song. They never put that song out as a single. Why? Because they didn't want you to buy one song. They wanted you to buy the whole album. Um, and the CD drove this enormous profitability. So in 97, 98, 99, when people like me were telling the industry, you ought to think about digital downloading and streaming someday, they weren't very interested. And this picture tells you why, because the business was just so profitable. And then Napster hit in 99, and you can see what happened. The industry plummeted up until 2013, 14. Downloads did come about. That's what these purple colors are. And the iTunes store was launched in 2003. Um, and it did replace some of the revenues, but the, the CD was just so powerful that the growth in the downloads never really compensated enough to see growth. It's only when streaming started to happen, dark green is paid subscriptions. And you can see how in the past, this, this chart only goes through 2019, if we look at uh, um, the annual revenues starting to climb again, finally, but we're still not at the point where we were 
when the CD was at its peak. So um, this is the reason people refer to the music industry as the canary in the coal mine of digital transformation, because we were the first ones that were hit by this. Um, and you know, now uh, in part because of COVID, we're seeing you know, the movie industry. One could argue that the Napster moment for the film industry may have been this year when people could no longer go to theaters and the industry had to move more significantly to a streaming model, right? In a few weeks, Wonder Woman will be released on HBO Max, a movie that they've been holding, hoping that theaters could reopen. And in some sense, the film industry is, is you know, going to try and duplicate what the movie, what the music business has done, which is come back to a much, much healthier position by adapting to these new forms of distribution. And today we've got lots and lots of services. Um, and, you know, when I was at Warner Music, I was the technology expert on the deals that were done with these. Some of them you don't recognize. There are some at the bottom, like Groove Shark and LimeWire that after Napster was shut down in its court cases became other illegal services. I was deposed in the cases against these companies, which were ultimately shut down by the courts for copyright infringement. The Cyrillic characters here, this is V Contacti, which is the biggest uh, music service in Russia. Russia traditionally had no recorded music revenues in its business. And now there's a deal with this service and all the major music labels. Tencent Music Entertainment is a huge company uh, in China and it licenses music from the majors. And there was no business in China either because uh, piracy was so rampant, but gradually the government has stepped in and twisted arms to behave a little better. And now China has gone from not showing up in the top countries in terms of annual revenues. It is now the seventh biggest revenue producing country in the world for the music business. That means its average revenue per user is still quite small because there's so many billions of people in China, but it's, it's gone from not mattering in terms of dollars to being a significant uh, player, all the way up to TikTok in the upper left which I'm sure given the demographic of some of the people on the call, they've used TikTok. And now you have record labels like Warner Music looking at TikTok data to find new artists to sign because they're catching on in these short videos. So the industry has gone to um, being much more global than it was. There were always affiliates from Sony and Universal Music around the world, but streaming services have really changed that model. iTunes is in over 100 countries. Spotify is in, I think, something like 84 countries. We are talking about hundreds of millions of paying subscribers, even more users than that uh, on free services like YouTube that are free to the consumer but supported by advertising. So, you know, th this is the world that I lived in for those 15 years at Warner, where we went from those enormous declines to building back to um, a, a legitimate business. Um, did it, didn't do a poll, but um, I assume many of the folks on the call, because it's the biggest service, use Spotify if they are a paying subscriber. And we're at the point now where there are 400 million music subscribers worldwide. Um, and despite the fact that Amazon and Apple have been growing, and interestingly, they grew from the demographics of their customer base, right? Apple grew once they finally shifted from selling downloads to streaming. They were able to convert Apple iTunes users to streaming users. Amazon added music streaming to Amazon Prime, which had appeal much more to uh, um, an older demographic than Spotify did, and in fact, the music genres that are popular on these other services, they're different. Spotify, the most popular genres are hip hop, um, and you don't find much in the way of uh, um, country music as an example, whereas uh, Amazon music, country music, and standards are more popular. So there's a market segmentation that's going on to some degree. Um, but even with all that growth and those companies being so large, I think Spotify actually hit its highest stock price ever yesterday, uh, in part because of their growth in podcasting. Um, but Spotify retains its position as the leader here. And unlike in the 
film industry, the services here are kind of similar in which music they offer, right? If you want to get um, Game of Thrones, you got to get HBO. But if you want to get Lady Gaga, you can subscribe to any one of these services, right? And the music industry has decided that they would, you know, rather have everyone sort of with the same catalog rather than dividing it up and making you subscribe to multiple services. Although I will add a large percentage of people have more than one music streaming service. Part of the reason for that is they get Amazon Music with Prime and they get Prime for delivery, but then they get it for the films now like Mrs. Maisel and, and TV shows, as well as for the, the movies, but they're getting it, their, their purchase decision was based on the, um, the low cost shipping of Amazon Prime. So that's sort of how, how we got to today. I'm gonna to talk more about how applied math plays a role because really music is always mathematical. I played an instrument when I was younger and my music teacher, the first time he met me said, you must be good in math because I counted so precisely when I was counting my measures. But certainly as Igor Stravinsky said, um, you know, mathematical thinking and relationships are awfully close to music. And you often find that mathematicians have a background in music, but let's use the audio CD as an example. Digitizing the analog signal um, uh, and turning it into zeros and ones that can be read from a laser on the CD was all about, you know, making a mathematical representation of uh, analog music. And that happened in 1982. Um, just as an aside, a little tidbit, if you never knew it, discs, CDs are played from the center to the outside as opposed to a vinyl record, which is, which is played where you put the needle down on the exterior of the disc and it goes towards the inside. The CD works in the opposite way. Um, and it can, originally it was, you know, it can hold a lot of data. The CD, when it was invented, 50 minutes of an album at 1.5 megabits per minute, it was 75 megabits bytes per album. In 1984, which is two years after the CD was introduced, the PC on the desk of anybody at a company, which would have been the best PC that people could buy, you know, sort of as standard equipment, only had a 20 megabyte hard drive. So you couldn't even, even if you could get the bits off the disk, you couldn't fit them in the hard drive on the computer. And that was the security measure, when you think about it, for the CD. So in some sense, that collapse of the industry was because CDs were in the clear. There was no protection on the bits, unlike DVDs that came later, but that was really because of the state of computer technology as it existed in the early 80s. But then there were a bunch of folks at Fraunhofer and Bell Labs, where I worked, where the MP3 was invented. I'm seeing a question in chat. Oh, somebody would just have to go. Okay, it wasn't a question. So the, the perceptual audio coding was built around an understanding of psychoacoustics and what things people could hear and not hear. And, you know, the early MP3 files were compressed a lot. 95% of the data from a CD gets thrown away to create 128K MP3, yet you still have a good result, something that you can listen to. Although, as I said, the executives at the music company thought it sounded kind of crappy. An MP3 uses fast Fourier transforms uh, as, as you know, the mathematical tool at the heart of the algorithms. And I've given a comparison here of the kind of bit rates and data that's available in streaming services today. Just as an example, Spotify streams at 320 kilobits per second. If you still have downloaded music, it's in a range from 128 to 320 that still represents an awful lot of compression off of the CD. Not only was, were these algorithms clever in terms of what they threw away and what they kept, they were simple enough and computers got powerful enough to run the algorithms on the PC so that you could put your CD in the drive and rip the data as the phrase became known, take the data off the CD, save it as an MP3, and at first transfer that data to your iPod. So at the heart of the um, digital music revolution, 
was getting the bits off the CD and into a format that could be sent around over networks. Um, and again, part of the reason Napster took off at universities is unlike most people that were still operating on, on you know, slow phone connections, universities had broadband by the time Napster came about. Um, but people wanted to listen on the go. They had their Walkman, they had their Discman. So in 1998, uh, Diamond introduced the product called the Rio, and that's a picture of it on the left. Um, it had 32 megabytes of solid state memory. It sold for $200 and it held all of 30 minutes of music. So if you were able to go to the gym in those days, and don't I wish we could go to the gym today, not happening. Um, you couldn't have a very long workout without repeating your songs, right? Just a few years later, in part because one of the key engineers at Apple went to a Toshiba factory that had this miniature hard drive um, that could store at that point a thousand songs. They offered the iPod in 2001 for $399, had a five gigabyte hard drive and enormously successful. I wish I had saved that first iPod because if you had one that was in basically untouched condition, you could list it on eBay today for $10,000. iPod wasn't the first MP3 player, but the reason it was successful was the close integration with the software in the iTunes store. So there's a picture of the iTunes download store featuring Kanye West's new album and the iPod came first, and then Steve Jobs convinced the record labels, who now were far more desperate than they were when I was meeting with them in the late 90s, to find a solution to compete with piracy. Um, one of the things that hurt the industry, even though downloads grew, was that you could buy songs individually in the iTunes store. That's something the labels would have never agreed to, if not for the fact that when you rip the CD and put all the songs onto Napster or LimeWire or any of the other unauthorized services, the, the album was broken up into individual songs already. There was no way to compete with piracy unless you sold songs individually. And because of that, Apple was able to get all the labels to agree to sell songs for 99 cents and albums for 10 bucks. And even though the number of transactions in the download space grew that didn't replace the revenues for um, uh, the CD sales enough to get the industry back to being healthy. And then of course, the thing that changed the business one more time was that smartphones came about with broadband data rates. Um, not coincidentally, Spotify launched in October of 2008 and the App Store gave you a way to put that technology in your hand. Um, but there were still issues because today we have Wi-Fi all over, we have much better connectivity. Data plans were far more limited in the you know, late aughts. And so what did you do to solve that problem? you let users store songs on the device. So if any of you have ever put a playlist as a download from Spotify, we go back to some of those same technologies that I was using uh, when we tried to launch a startup using cryptography to ensure the music doesn't play when the subscription lapses. So in fact, your Spotify subscription on your phone comes with a key. That key lasts for 30 days or so. And at the end of those 30 days, you got to get a new key. And if you don't get a new key, you can't play the songs that you've stored on your device. And that design and implementation of those kind of features, that was my job at Warner Music. My job was to talk to the engineers at each one of the companies, whether it was Spotify or Apple Music, and ensure that the technical specifics were good enough for the company to be satisfied with what they were doing. So every contract was long because of all the financial terms, but there was always a technology addendum to the agreement. And it was my job to sign off on behalf of the company for those technology aspects of the, the business. And so now we have millions of users and billions of listens. In fact, 
There were more than a trillion listens on Spotify in the past year. And so all this data has become fuel for the industry to use to get smarter. And they use it in a bunch of ways. They use it to find new artists. So they're looking on TikTok. They're looking at engagement on Instagram and other media. Is, is the fact that this artist has um, you know, a fan base uh, that seems engaged in what they're doing, that will be a contributing factor in addition to, of course, the quality of the music that they make. Um, they'll look at the geographic data associated with their songs being identified by apps like Shazam or which territories are streaming or countries, and they will route tours based on the local popularity. Uh, the metal band Metallica um, use the data from Spotify geographical information to decide what their playlist would be in individual cities as they toured. So they would look at which of their songs were most popular in Milwaukee, and they would play the songs that were popular in Milwaukee when they toured in that city. Um, the demographic data and information about what fans and customers are interested in. So if you're Chevrolet looking for a song for a commercial, you will identify an artist whose fans match up well with the demographics of the audience you're seeking for the new um, you know, flatbed pickup truck. So they're looking at demographic and psychographic information to see where there is a match between the fans of particular musical artists and the fans of, uh, and the, the purchasers for consumer brands. Um, if any of you are users of these streaming services, you have playlists like Discover Weekly, or you know, you're getting data right now about what you listen to most during the year. They're creating those personalized playlists based on machine learning and artificial intelligence to increase engagement. If you skip the track, you're not gonna see it again. If you give a thumbs down on Pandora, that data is feeding these engines to determine what your preferences are. Um, they use it if you're Live Nation and you uh, have events happening live. Won't that be nice when we can go to concerts again next year? Um, you know, you target the best fans and give them special perks. So you go to somebody like me who's been to a lot of concerts for Bruce Springsteen and you make an offer for a VIP package because you know that I've how much money I've spent on tickets and you know that I went to the Springsteen on Broadway show not once but two times. So you will use that data to target me with specific offers and generate incremental revenues from your best fans. And finally, in a new wave that's coming is that people are using this data to generate new music. They are analyzing what's most popular in Latin tracks and giving tips to songwriters based on that information. In some cases, they're generating information that can be used for production music that backs commercials or lower cost films. So there's a company called Amper Music in New York City that was just purchased by Shutterstock, the photo company that generates music using artificial intelligence uh, on the characteristics of those songs. That's the end of my talk. We are ending with the future. Here's the question that maybe the only the older people can ask. This is I, as the chief technology strategist, I didn't often get to meet or work with artists, but these are two well-known artists, but they're too old for most of the people on this call. But I will, if anybody recognizes either one, they get bonus points. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Neil Young and, and Mr. Plant. Correct. Led Zeppelin and Neil Young. <laughs> Robert Plant. From Robert Hollywood. Plant, yes. <laughs> so that's the end of my talk. I'm happy to take questions. Well, uh, let, let me start off by uh, giving you some questions that were submitted in advance, Howie. Okay. Okay. First one is, um, did you always know you were going into the music analytic route? Or probably not, but what was the turning point that sparked you to make that decision? And what do you think are some of the most profound connections between math and music? Well, I think I answered the second part already. 
in right. terms of math and music. In terms of the thing for me, part of it was the, I sort of made the decision to leave AT&T and go do something new because the, pro the new projects I worked on, like that video phone, I ended up managing teams that kept getting shut down, right? The, the project didn't go well and then I had to find new jobs for people. And I didn't particularly like that. And I decided I would go all in. And when we were gonna shift this music project, which I already always loved music, but I never knew I would end up in music, but it seemed to fit you know, the skills that I have. And I fortunately met somebody who knew the music business well. And so I really got uh, uh, enamored with this idea of working on this transition that was sure to happen, right? We, we had all the elements, we knew it was gonna happen. It didn't happen the way we expected. Um, and so I had sort of made that decision to, to leave AT&T and Bell Labs and go do something new. Um, and, you know, the music thing was a good fit. I don't know that I would have predicted I would have been in the music business as long as I was at Bell Labs, though. Another question. Is audio video compression still an active research area? Um, yes, it is. Um, and I believe a lot of it is... Um, you know, just to pick one example, there were patents filed this week from a group of um, uh, former Apple engineers for a, a, an immersive speaker um, that was based on some new format stuff for giving, you know, a better whole house sound from a single speaker. So you're still having it. There isn't, I mean, there are still new standards coming out of places like Fraunhofer. Bell Labs doesn't do as much work as they used to do, but there isn't the the Bell Labs of today isn't what I joined, you know, all those years ago. So there is still work going on because even with all of the compression we already have, if you just think about everybody streaming, you know, let's let's use that Wonder Woman movie. If everybody watches it that same day, there's going to be an awful lot of bandwidth demanded uh, <laughs> from HBO Max on that day or for the past two weeks to watch Queen's Gambit on Netflix. Um, so it's still playing a role and that's part of the reason why your image degrades when you're watching Netflix sometimes and it's not quite as crisp as you want it to be. How, so here's a very specific one. How is the operations research program at Cornell? What can you tell people about it who might be interested for masters or PhDs? Um, obviously it, it set me up well and the advice you gave me about going there was good. Um, it's an interesting mixture because I sort of highlighted that it's a, a very much a mix of some very theoretical people and mathematical people, if that's what you wanted to pursue, and a bunch of much more practical applied people. So the Master of Engineering program, um, you know, has a terrific reputation and still, um, you know, places people with, with companies and does a lot of work with, with industry. Um, so it... I was fortunate that I was someplace where when I decided I wanted to be more applied and less theoretical, I could still do it. And I think that's one of the, the real positives. You have to be willing to live in Ithaca, though. <laughs> um, we're open to questions from the audience now. These are all the, I've gone through all the pre-recorded ones. Hey, uh, Howie. Yes. This is, it was a great, great, it was really great to hear from you. I mean, I'm a Stony Brook graduate, 1973. Steve Adabo is my name. Uh, I was one of, one of two music engineering majors that graduated from Stony Brook. And uh, I took a very different path than you did. You know, I went off and I was a guitar player. And um, even the, uh, it's not really a question. I'm just kind of commenting on, on, on the impact you have had on my life, you know, in terms of being a producer, an active uh manager who found some artists like Suzanne Vega, Sean Colvin, got them signed and then went through the whole downturn with everyone else um, in terms of, um, you know, going from CDs to streaming to Napster and and now coming out the other end with with, uh, you know, Spotify and and uh, just living through it all, being in the trenches here with musicians and doing it. And we have to adjust. And I think there was a lot of grumbling about all this digital stuff. But, you know, to me, I'm in my studio right now and I have a wealth of power behind me. I have 
all the old analog stuff plus all the fantastic digital stuff and um i just kind of i guess i want to thank you <laughs> i mean oh, maybe that's I, my point you know I, you're welcome i appreciate that i mean there still are a lot of complaints people still feel that the money that flows through to artists from these streaming services is is not enough and the, the well, calculations okay. ought to be changed and you know uh we yeah, have they artists they like, they like taylor Swift. Really like old, i'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt. They don't realize the old model was based on airplay and, you know, one spin on a radio station reached half a million people or 10 million people, you know, one spin on your computer is reaching one person, you know, so I mean, there's, I, I you know, I, I get, I get a little money from Spotify and stuff from my royalties, but it, it's, yeah. um, the, it, the it was really... this year is that, you know, the, the touring and live business is, you oh. know, has, has been one of the, we talked about the movie theater business, but the live entertainment business, you know, uh, uh, we all are hoping that it can come back to what it was. Yeah, no, I know a lot of my friends are just sitting at home. It's terrible. You know, how many online concerts can you watch? You know, it's, it's... <laughs> but thank you very much. It was, it was informative to really hear the, hear the whole path of it. And, and in terms of the MP3, a story that I found out way later was Dr. Brandenburg, who was the, uh, one of the authors of the algorithm. Yes. Um, listen, listen to a recording of mine, which was Suzanne Vega's a cappella version of Tom's Diner, the, yes. the, 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 which everyone in the world knows. And he said if he could get that right, you know, if he could get that to sound good with his algorithm of 10% of the data, then he'd do good. So he probably listened to that 5,000 times. You yeah, know? I heard it a lot at Bell Labs that they were tweaking the algorithm. Really? They, yes. Again? Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. Well, that was me. But the funny thing was that was recorded on an early... Uh, uh, digital system, the Sony F1, you know, actually onto a Betamax tape. That was how that was originally done. The rest of the album was all 24 track analog, but for the acapella, I wanted no tape hiss. So I actually recorded, it was actually one of the earliest recording, you know, digital recordings and it got, it got used. So yeah. I felt, you know, I felt, I feel a little responsible somehow. <laughs> you should. Other questions? What are you doing now? Teaching at NYU. Oh, okay. Yeah, I work with them too. Consulting. Yeah, I teach the, uh, I, I work with the, uh, um, the music production, the Clive Davis production. I teach them microphone stuff and, you know, they come. Yeah, I'm, I'm in Steinhardt, which is where the music business program right. is. Right, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Know it well. Did you remember Thank that you. picture, Alan, that I put up of you? <laughs> <laughs> Alan, you're muted. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't uh, know it existed, <laughs> but I have seen pictures of myself in the, in the seventies with the, with that. It was, it was a long time ago. You, you, uh, you were there when the math tower had just opened up. Yeah. That was in uh, January, I think of 74. Right. Otherwise, I eliminated the picture of the bridge to nowhere, which we right. remember. <laughs> and before that, the applied math, when you were most of the time a major, the applied math department and the math department were down where the dental school is now. Th thank you very much, Howie. Again, it's really nice for you to come back. And, um, you know, we had a good audience here. This is better turnout than I have in my 100 student uh, Graph Theory 2 class of 100. So um, you, you got good interest at a time when people have a lot of other things on your, their mind. Um, really appreciate you uh, taking the time. And I think we should all do a little bit of audio clapping for Howie. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Okay, bye. Thanks, Howie. Uh, before I let all of you go, I just wanted to uh, say that coming up, we will have more speakers for the Applied Math and Statistics Alumni Spotlight Series. Uh, we have one scheduled for February. I'm hoping to slate one in for January. And so we'll try to make this monthly. And of course, you'll know there's uh, myriad topics that we can cover in Applied Math and Statistics. So stay tuned and uh, thank you all for being here.